PATV presents Live from Prairie Lights, featuring the best authors and poets on the scene today. From up and coming to well established writers from across the globe, you'll see them right here on PATV. Good evening. Ooh. <laughs> this is exciting. Good evening. And welcome to the first. This sounds weird. Right. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> and welcome to the first public reading of the Community Stories Writing Workshop at Shelter House, Iowa City. My name is Racina Liu, and I, along with Matt Gilchrist and Meg Jacobs, am one of the co facilitators of the workshop. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to celebrate the writer's work. We are so happy and excited to be here and a little nervous. <laughs> In a town like Iowa City, recently designated a UNESCO City of Literature, all writers in the community ought to have a space to create, reflect, and share drafts. As writers and writing teachers, Matt, Meg, and I feel especially privileged to be part of this initiative to provide, that provides greater access to the literary identity of Iowa City. Our group, the Community Stories Writing Workshop, is one of several services at the Shelter House. Since inception, we have collaborated closely with other service program facilitators and case managers at Shelter House to invite members who are interested in storytelling by way of narrative writing and alternative forms of expression to join us weekly as we read, reflect, write, and revise stories. Through the telling and retelling of stories, writers make sense and meaning of the experiences they bring to and take from the writing workshop. The Community Stories Writing Workshop would not exist and tonight's celebration would not happen were it not for the collaborative efforts of the community. We especially thank Jan Wise Miller and Prairie Lights for offering the reading space for tonight's celebration and for its very generous donation of 10% of today's sales to the Shelter House. We also thank the Center for the Book at the University of Iowa for this beautifully bound book, it's gorgeous, um, in which the writer's stories are published. Many individuals, including Melissa Morton and Katie Wollen, who have committed their own time to create the binding as well as the page designs for this compilation. Finally, we thank the staff at the Shelter House Iowa City for their endless support of the Community Stories Writing Workshop since its inception in fall 2010. Without the support of Chrissy Canganelli, Coffee Dixon, Phoebe Trepp, CJ Cash, and all the case managers, we would not have had the opportunity to work with the many talented writers who have come to the Community Stories Writing Workshop. Since last fall, we have had almost 30 resident writers participate in the writing group. Tonight, we will hear from five of them. These essays, have all undergone a revision process entailing peer group responses, and at the end, the writer makes the final decision for her draft. The finished piece is then published in the Community Stories portfolio, which resides in the Shelter House's library. From these readings, we will hear tonight from fathers, mothers, musicians, poets, writers, whose voices deliver as much humor as they do poignancy. Theirs are powerful stories of the everyday, of keen observations about father-daughter relationships, independent living, friendships, and community. Each has a voice, one of many, that when combined with others, creates the literary diversity that is Iowa City. To introduce our readers tonight is one of my colleagues and co-facilitators of the Community Stories Writing Workshop, Meg Jacobs. Thank you, Racina. Good evening, my name is Meg Jacobs. It is my pleasure to introduce the readers and writers tonight. 
The first writer, Thomas W. Case. If you ask Thomas about himself, the first two things he'll tell you is that first, he's a father of three, and second, he's a writer, a poet, in fact, one who writes wickedly honest poems about the harsh ironies of life, about its regretful moments, and about its demand for survival. His are strings of lyrical observations, beauty in the unlikely, poignant, and tragic. A dreamer since age five, Thomas recalls his first piece of writing. At five years old, on construction paper, I wrote a note that said, Dear Mom, I've left home. Love, Tom. <laughs> I walked around the block with a knapsack that day and thought, I'm free now. By age 12, Thomas had compiled his first series of poems and short stories. By his 30s, he published his first book, The Bullfrog Dreams of Flying, in which he writes about memories of the racetrack and his father's death, about marriage counseling sessions and his eventual divorce, about growing up on several acres of land and youthful yearning for life, with a little bit of humor, sarcasm, and irony. The collection represents some of his most accomplished work. In addition, his poetry has been published in four volumes of Lyrical Iowa, 2004, 2006, 2007, and 2008. More recently, one of his pieces, also titled after his book, The Bullfrog Dreams of Flying, was selected for the 2011 Iowa City Poetry and Public Project. Today, Thomas will share with us some of his writing from the Community Stories Writing Workshop, including two poems, which he will share at the end of the reading, and a humorous short story, which he shares now, about a childhood memory of Brother Toby and the Meter Man. Please welcome our first reader, Thomas W. Case. This is uh, called Whoops. One Monday morning, when I was nine years old, I woke up with a stomach ache. Mom decided to keep me home from school. Coincidentally, when I went upstairs and told my brother Toby that I was sick and didn't have to go to school, he didn't feel well either and quickly let Mom know. She went to work and left us home alone, but not before she poked and prodded all the available orifices in our heads. We began to feel much better after her departure. Mom was a teacher by trade and taught us a lot. She always said, look both ways when crossing the street, and be careful of the stray dogs. They could have rabies. And most often, she said, beware of strangers. She always went on and on about the dangers that loomed and lay in wait for nice, innocent children. Often, I thought someone might kidnap me at breakfast, or that I would be struck by lightning if I walked in the rain. We lived in a large two-story house on Des Moines' west side. It had an attic and a big unfinished basement, complete with cobwebs and secret passages. A child could get lost in that house. Mom lived there when she was a little girl with her mother and grandmother. Once a month, she would get out the old family photo albums. Toby and I would sit next to her on the gaudy gold couch, dotted with cigarette burns. In all of Mom's warnings, one thing she never said was, Watch out for taking too much Valium. You could fall asleep with a cigarette in your hand and burn the house down. As she turned the tattered pages, she'd say, there's your great aunt Betty. She was what they called a blue baby. Bad heart, poor little thing. I'd solemnly look over at Toby. He would bare his teeth like a nasty little chihuahua with mange, then smile and stick his tongue out. The pages were yellow and smelled of mothballs. The pictures were black and white. Everyone looked grim and ghastly, and most of the people had long since passed away. A paper graveyard, frightening, final. To make matters worse, Mom told us stories about our relatives in the pictures. One in particular still haunts my mind. Our cousin Dorothy hanged herself and then supposedly appeared at the foot of her mother's bed saying, help me, Mom. This vivid image didn't make for peaceful slumber. Mom used to wake up early, wake us up early on Sunday mornings. She dragged us to the nursing home to see Grandma Nellie. One day, a thin, chalk-skinned, ancient-looking woman with no teeth and huge, pale eyes grabbed Toby and pulled him close, saying, Oh, Billy, you finally come for me. 
I've got you now, Billy boy, and you're not getting away. Toby cried and screamed like a little baby. As I recall, he spat at her. He's looked on the elderly with suspicion ever since. An old, scary, white-haired lady used to live next door to us. Toby and I would visit her for candy and cookies. Besides the heavenly sugar buzz, we were drawn to her macabre stories, even though they gave us nightmares. Her name was Mrs. Sweet, although she was anything but. Mrs. Sweet and her husband, who had passed away some years before, had owned a funeral parlor, and she used to tell us in vivid detail of how the various citizens of her country bumpkin town met their demise, and how she had spent long hours preparing little Jim Bob for the viewing after he'd been killed by a sow on the farm. His mama warned him over and over. She told him that a sow turns vicious when she has a litter of piglets. But he couldn't help himself. He loved those babies. They intrigued him so. Poor Jimmy, she said as she shook her head. A terrible odor permeated Mrs. Sweet's kitchen, where we sat and listened to her sordid tales. Later, we found out that the smell was cheap wine, wild Irish rose to be exact, and when she drank too much, she cussed like a sailor. The second time she told us the pig story, she said, that big old sow was out rooting around in the mud and mire in the corral, away from her piglets. Well, that sneaky little son of a bitch, Jim Bob, thought he'd grab one and play with it. Poor bastard didn't know what hit him. She nearly chewed off his arm. Bit a big old hole in the side of his neck, she did. That's what killed him. Poor little shit. <laughs> Toby and I used to have long, drawn-out conversations on whether or not she was a witch and when and how she would attempt to kill us. Poison cookies? Candy? Maybe she'd have a rabid pig with six-inch fangs devour us in our sleep. Back then, Toby thought that every woman with gray hair was a witch or a psychopathic axe murderer. <laughs> so there we were, alone in our creepy house, with a dark basement and foreboding attic. We six fixed cereal for breakfast and then tiptoed to the living room, glancing over our shoulders the whole way half expecting to see a zombie or ghost following us. We flopped down in front of the TV, turned the channel to Scooby-Doo, and covered up with blankets to our chins. Although Scooby-Doo was comical, it had its darker moments. Did you hear that, Toby said? What, I whispered. Someone knocked at the back door, he said. My heart thumped in my chest. I listened attentively. I didn't hear anything, I murmured. There was a moment of silence that seemed like an eternity. Then came an unmistakable knock, knock, knock on the side door. We looked at each other, our eyes big and frozen. Let's go check it out, I said, pulling the covers off. Toby and I walked slowly towards the door. As we approached, another loud knocking noise startled us, almost to the point of running. We composed ourselves, went down the three steps beside the kitchen, and then stared at the ominous shadow on the other side of the door. Who is it? I said, trying to sound brave. Meter man, I'm here to read the meter. The shadow spoke with a low, gravelly voice. Toby had a tight hold of my shirt and tugged on it whenever I moved. I opened the door a few inches. There before me stood a large, ugly man with a big head, furrowed brows, and a long black beard. He said, the meter's in the basement, I'll just be a minute. Toby whispered something in my ear. I couldn't quite make it out, but it sounded like, I'm pretty sure he's a killer. <laughs> I paused, then swung the door open and stepped back with Toby tightly gripping my shirt. The man stepped in, passed us, and climbed down the rickety basement stairs. Did you see that? Toby said. What? On his tool belt. On his tool belt, Toby said, with eyes like dinner plates. No, what, what? Toby took a deep breath like he was composing himself. He still looked scared, but I noticed an ever so subtle, impish grin. He had a gun, Toby whispered. No, he didn't. That was a screwdriver. No, it wasn't, Toby said. It was a gun. Well, what should we do, I asked. We better lock him down there, he said. <laughs> Like that was the obvious solution. And I was stupid for not thinking of it first. 
My brother reached over and deftly turned the lock on the basement door. It was a simple, quick movement, like stealing a piece of candy. Toby looked at me and grinned like a dog that had just pissed on your favorite rug. What now, I said. Just wait, Toby replied. Just then, we heard the wooden basement steps begin to creak like a heartbeat, a pulse, thump, thump, thump. We watched the doorknob turn, then wiggle, then shake violently. Toby giggled, then burst into laughter and ran out of the back door. I followed. We ran and laughed and laughed and ran until our little legs wouldn't carry us anymore. We wrestled for a while beneath a willow tree and then swung from the long vines, pretending we were escaping certain death from rabid pigs, witches, and killer meter men that waited in the soft green grass below. At dusk, on our way home, I stole Mom some peonies from Mrs. Sweet's yard, despite her warning. If I catch you damn kids in my garden, there's going to be big trouble. Those large, lovely, multicolored flowers attracted ants and dangerous bees. I was very careful. If a person were allergic, a bee sting could kill them. Thank you, Thomas. Before we continue, there will be adult language in the stories tonight. Sorry that I did not say that before. I'm assuming that many of you have been to Prairie Lights readings before and realized that swearing is okay here. <laughs> Our next reader, Anthony Ballester, is one of the first members of the Community Stories Writing Workshop. In fact, after the first meeting, he was the only member until we moved to the new Shelter House facility. Anthony is now living independently in Iowa City and works at the Goodwill store. Whenever possible, he still joins us for a session or two, and often with a draft in hand. I haven't come to the group meetings lately, he'll say, but I've been writing. He usually writes about his daily observations, and sometimes when he's in the mood, when he is especially inspired, he writes about his loved ones. Tonight, he will read two short pieces, one about community and one about a cheeseburger that he wishes to get bronzed. This cheeseburger, the one in his story is based on a memory Anthony has of his then three-year-old daughter. It is a memory of her refusal to eat the cheese beef sandwich and of his poor choice of words in response. Striking in this draft is his presence on the page. So strong are the attitudes, the sarcasm, the rhythm, the timing. Although he has written many other stories during his time in the workshop, this is the first piece Anthony has shared about his daughter, for his daughter, and perhaps one day with his daughter. Tonight, he shares it with all of us. Please welcome Anthony Ballester. I was a resident of the old shelter in 2004 and then part of it in 2010. A few, a few weeks before the new opening, the living condition in the old shelter weren't all that suitable, but in all, it was still shelter. I remember the new shelter went through many hoops and roadblocks faced a lot of red tape, court hearings, protests, and community outcry in the new area. Nobody wanted us in their area for fear of their safety. Homeless, no good bums, drug and alcohol abusers, criminals, hopeless beings. Now that the new shelter house is finally approved and awesomely built, after all the obstacles the shelter house representatives had to endure is now part of history, which makes me a part of that history too, not only in the year 2004, but in the year 2010. Second one is called Bronze and a che Cheeseburger. My daughter was a few months shy of her third birthday, and her words and speaking, her ways of talking, were coming together in a lot of ways. During this time in her life, she was hooked on little Debbie brownies to the point of actually sneaking them into the cupboard and taking them without me knowing, as I had limited her only to one a day. So one day, as I was cleaning her room, I happened to look in her clothes closet and notice her quilt and some other stuffed animals on the closet floor. I picked them up, only to find a half dozen brownie wrappers, <laughs> along with a cereal bowl with fruity pebbles dried to it and a spoon. I took them all into the kitchen, and then I called out to my daughter. I found your little stash in your closet. Is this yours, I asked. 
with guilt written in neon on her forehead, she told me, no, Daddy. Being a bit disappointed in her for not being honest with me, I told her, stop trying to, buy, try, excuse me, stop trying to be slick. All the while, I was trying to keep a straight face to somewhat being a serious father. I remember as a kid, I was sneaking to the cupboard for a snack whenever my mother wasn't looking. Later in the evening, I prepared cheeseburgers for dinner. When I called my daughter to eat, she sat down, looked at the plate, and flat out told me, I don't want to eat this. I want a Debbie Brownie. <laughs> I was taken aback a little as I thought, this kid is trying to play me to cave in, to let her get her way. So I said to her, oh no, you're going to eat the cheeseburger. She said to me, no daddy, I want a Debbie Brownie, she said. So again, this time in a harsh tone of voice, I said, you're going to eat the fucking cheeseburger or go hungry. <laughs> Simple as that, little girl. I didn't mean to say a cuss word to my daughter, as cuss words were rare between her mother and me in front of our daughter. A few days later, my daughter and I stopped at McDonald's to eat. As we were moving up the line closer to the cashier, I asked my daughter what she wanted to eat, and she said, Daddy, I want a fucking cheeseburger. <laughs> I looked at her startled. What did you just say? Again, she said, Daddy, I want a fucking cheeseburger. There was a wounded woman in front of us. She turned back and asked, did I hear your little girl say what I thought she said? I tried to play it off as best I could. Oh, my daughter calls a happy meal a happy cheeseburger, that's all. My daughter hearing this said, no, Daddy, I want a fucking cheeseburger. At this point, I didn't know what to do. All I knew was someone needed to wash this little girl's out, mouth out with soap or else we'd get Eddie sick for McDonald's for life, especially if this older woman and others had heard my daughter say a bad word out loud. But instead, the older woman looked down at my daughter and busted out laughing. I was trying not to laugh also. I looked at my daughter's child face. Her expression was one of confusion. All she knew was fucking was a word and put, put in front of a cheeseburger. <laughs> Later, I talked to her about it. She never asked for another fucking cheeseburger again. <laughs> Time passed on one day. I reminded her of the story. Remember the kind of cheeseburger you wanted at McDonald's? My daughter looked at me in a blank stare and said, Daddy, I was just a little kid back then. She was, at this point, only four years old. <clears throat> Some people brought their kids' first pair of shoes. Me, I brought my, do my daughter's cheeseburger. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> Our next writer is Patty Sylvia. Patty Sylvia is an inspiration. She inspires herself daily with her resolve and her newly emerging attitude of possibility. She inspires others to see that they too can accomplish their goals. Patty is a recovering addict who for many years watched her body shrink to skin and bones, eroded by drug abuse. She was a user, but she is not that person anymore, and she's ready to tell the world how much better it is to be clean. Her testament, which she shares in Narcotics Anonymous meetings with her church community and with the Community Stories Writing Workshop at the Shelter House, is proof that a person who had lost herself to drugs can regain her standing as a contributor of our community. Recovering from addiction is one story Patty shares. Another is her involvement in community organizations. Patty volunteers for her church's food bank, unloading truckloads of donated food and helping to provide that food to the needy as an important part of her weekly routine. She also helps people in need find clothing that makes them feel positive about their appearance instead of insecure. The story Patty shares tonight is a juxtaposition of using time with clean time. I think you will be impressed, as I am, with her ability to describe the lack of control she experienced on drugs, as well as to acknowledge precisely what is best about being clean from drugs, namely her confidence and composure. Please join me in welcoming Patty Sylvia. Good evening. My story is called Clean and Sober. Now that I am clear from all mind-altering substances, I have so much to be grateful for. It has given me peace of mind and self-esteem. I find myself worrying more over the way I look. I dress nicer and I wear makeup every day and try to do things with my hair. I haven't cared about those things in about 10 years or so. It used to be that I was too busy getting high or sleeping it off, if I slept at all, to pay any attention to good things in life that I had to offer. Now I get up in the mornings and I hear the chirping sounds of little birds. 
I see all the beautiful colors of all different kinds of flowers and smell the morning dew. It's nice to feel the warmth of the sun so early in the day. I never realized what I was missing, just sitting in a dark house with no curtains or windows open so that I could do drugs. I also have gained a lot of respect from the community. I try to do lots of service work, such as on Wednesdays, I work at a food bank at my church. I give out food to those in need. They are able to come in twice a month and go through the place and pick out whatever they need if we have it. On Thursdays, I work at a clothing bank, giving away clothes that are needed at no cost. We have all kinds of items there, and you can just come in and pick out whatever you see that you need there. I even find myself picking up items for others in need. It also brings me great pleasure knowing that I am so needed. It builds up my self-esteem more and more every day that I work. People that I haven't seen in a long time can't believe how much I've changed in the way I take care of myself and present myself. Also, because of all these changes, it helps keep a smile on my face because it makes me feel like I belong and I have a feeling of self-worth. All this has taught me to think and talk more rationally than I used to. I don't just jump into anger as I did in the past. I take time to rationalize my emotions and thoughts. I used to speak by shouting and then think about the situation later. Not long ago, I would get upset at stupid little things and scream and holler, maybe even throw things and break things. I can recall a moment when I had a few friends at my house and we had been awake for three to four days straight. This one guy got drunk and started an argument with another one of my friends. I tried to stop the argument and asked the first guy who was causing the trouble to leave, but he wouldn't. We got into a yelling match and I told him he had better get out because I was not going to be disrespected in my own house. He then called me a bitch and told me that he was not going to leave. I was sitting in a chair across the room and I had a plate of food in my lap. I got so mad that I didn't care what kind of mess it would make, I just threw it across the room with full force at him. I threw it so hard that it actually almost stuck into the wall like a knife. It put everyone in my house in a state of shock, including myself. Everybody's eyes got huge and they all shut up. The guy I was mad at didn't move at this point, so I got up off my chair and went across the room. I grabbed him by his shirt at about chest level and pushed him toward the door. I then told him if he gave me any more trouble, the next thing I would throw would be him and that he, instead of the plate, would put the next hole in the wall. He got the hint and left at that moment. Then I sat back down in my chair after look, locking the door behind him and apologized to my other company. They told me they could not believe that I could get that mad at anybody. After we talked about the incident and I calmed down and started joking again. I don't let things get me that mad anymore because I'm not doing drugs and I can better, han better handle my anger. Now when I want something or I want somebody to listen, I do it in a calmer manner. A few weeks ago after moving out of the rehab, I was put on house arrest. I was really pissed off and wanted to flip out, but I decided to just take it with a grain of salt because acting on my anger would have gotten me into more trouble. Instead, because of the way I handled it, instead of doing a month of house arrest, I only ended up doing two weeks. You know, they say you can get more with honey than you can with lemons. That saying has turned out to be so true. Thank you. Our next writer was unable to join us tonight. Kimberly Winchell resides in the Des Moines area where she grew up and raised her children. During her stay at Shelter House, she was outspoken about the stereotypes facing people who are homeless and often supported her fellow writers in the workshop in important ways. Kim patiently listened to the challenges others were facing and frequently offered words of encouragement. Kim has described herself as someone who has loved to write since childhood, particularly children's books and fiction stories. Her most beloved character, Mrs. Big a Little, is a fictitious representation of one of her elementary school teachers who made it into several of her stories. The story she has asked us to share tonight is illustrative of the change in Kim's writing during her time in the Community Stories Writing Workshop. Although she went to great lengths to help other residents confront painful memories or struggles through writing, she rarely took this risk herself. Bye Bye Barbie is her most personal work to date. Kim confronts the pain of letting go of a childhood toy that she has carried with her through a divorce and several moves. Her story captures themes of identity, loss, and renewal. Rosina will read on her behalf.
Bye Bye Barbie by Kimberly Winchell. Forty-seven years ago, when I was six, I received the best Christmas present ever, before and since. It was a bubble-haired Barbie, a cardboard, suitcase-like Barbie dream house, and a spiffy blue Alfa Romeo sport, Barbie sports car. This was before plastic ruled, and even the furniture that came with the dream house was cardboard. I played with it so carefully, but often and surprisingly, it sustained very little damage for all those hours of solitary play acting. I lived in the country on a little farm and didn't have other children to play with besides my brother, who, even at seven, was too manly to play with dolls. My father was not a man who believed in extras, so those Christmas toys were definitely magical. As I grew into a teenager, I would put those toys away in our attic. As they collected dust, they stayed safe, and I didn't have to think about them. At 18, I married. I married as a way to escape my father and moved from my childhood home. I didn't have... I didn't give much thought to those attic treasures. Then my parents sold the farm, and suddenly I was back in the attic sorting through old clothes and old toys. There was Barbie, her car, and the beautiful dream house. What was I going to do with those childhood mementos? I took them to my home and stored them in my attic. Ten years later, I divorced sold my house, and moved my children to a different city to start a new life. Once again, Barbie, her dream house and car, moved with me and proudly took their place in the attic eaves of our new home. Ten more years passed. My kids grew up and moved on with their new lives, and I was once again contemplating moving and downsizing. I found myself sitting in the attic amongst my childhood toys, ones that my children didn't want. I put an advertisement in the Des Moines Register newspaper, and in less than a week, all those toys were sold. But I still hadn't parted with Barbie and her wonderful accessories. Two months later, I packed all my antiques, housewares, clothes, and linens. I was again upstairs, sitting on the floor of the attic, and spending a last play date with Barbie. You know, I'm gonna miss you, I whispered, as I stacked the cardboard furniture inside the dream house, put Bar Barbie back in her original box, and placed her blue Alfa Romeo into a plastic grocery sack. I carried them through my son's two connecting rooms, which still con contained his old couch, formerly mine, and an old wooden stereo stand. I gave a last forlorn look back into those moat-filled, slanted ceiling rooms, blew a little kiss into the quiet, and then quickly descended the steep stairs. Memories threatened to follow me, but I turned a cruel back. The future waited ahead. I arranged Barbie, her car, and dream house in the bare, echoing living room and sat down beside them to wait. They, too, would be gone in an hour, sold to a young mother and her six-year-old daughter. Thank you. Our next writer, Joel Neuse, is a father, an architect, a musician, and a writer. Joel writes about his former career, his family and friends, and his childhood with a cunning sense of humor. His writing is poignant and earnest. Joel's contribution to this community of writers extends far beyond his own stories. He both validates the stories of his fellow writers, and he openly challenges the prevailing assumptions about homelessness. As he so eloquently stated during a planning session for tonight's reading, the authenticity of the stories allows them to stand for themselves. Joel's latest reflection evolved from a conversation about Facebook in the Community Stories Writing Workshop. 
He was struck by the sincerity of a former classmate who friended him on Facebook when she recalled a special pencil box he carried with him in the second grade. Joel reflected on these moments, the one from his elementary school past and the moment he read her comment on Facebook. He wrestled with his own insincerity as he marveled in the discovery that someone would remember something so dear to him, someone he had not always been kind to. The pencil box became the focus for the piece he will read tonight. Please join me in welcoming Joel Muse. Melinda and I uh, became friends on Facebook over a decade after we graduated high school. And I'm not sure we had spoken much to each other since the sixth grade. When I saw her on Facebook, I was pleased to see she was married and had kids. Her, on pro her online profile sported her children's cheery faces and the sort of random personal thoughts that put me in good humor. I liked her online persona and I felt free to comment. At the same time as this friendship was resuming online, I had been going through the experience of first being isolated by my family and then separating myself from them. I posted my thoughts and feelings about this painful situation to Facebook, and it was through my, same, my shameless <clears throat> posts of dark humor, vicious comebacks against my family's criticism, and honest rage that people like Melinda began to comment with care and concern. Some online friends shared memories that resurfaced, and these exchanges reestablished friendships. One day, I got a Facebook notification that I had a new message from Melinda. Joel, I was thinking about you and remembered the pencil box you used at school. I think we were in the third grade, and you showed it to me. Do you still have it? Do you remember? I replied, oh, yeah. That's uh, kicking around the house in Washington. I'm, I sure was proud of that thing. Thanks for thinking of me. It was a simple nostalgic exchange, but the truth is whenever I think of Melinda, I think of the time in which I was mean to her in the sixth grade. The teacher had us line up according to size. She was short and a little chunky. When we got to the lower end of the continuum, it was a toss up between her and the shortest boy. And I said, which way? And there was an awful silence. As soon as I could face her, I found a quiet setting to apologize. I said, gosh, I didn't intend to be so mean. I'm sorry. It's OK, she said, but it wasn't. And these kinds of regrets are why, whenever people write me, they are always sending me a little bit of hell to dwell in as I attempt to conduct myself with some degree of sensitivity, tact, and due regard for the decency and feelings of others. I did truly love the pencil box. It showed, I showed it off to my classmates as a way of masking my personal insecurities regarding what I perceived as other people's latent contempt for my social inadequacy. See? Look at my box. It's got my name on it. <laughs> on the cover of an otherwise generic blue pencil box was a locomotive-shaped sticker with a couple of rail cars and a caboose trailing behind it. My mom had it painted with my name spelled out calligraphically in the poof of smoke billowing from the locomotive spokestack. The pencil box is now well worn with some graffiti and two stickers stuck to the inside of the lid that say, I'm an Iowa Stater. I had looted it from an ISU alum state fair display. It went with me to college, but mom gave it to me in preparation for the second grade in a creatively cathartic expression of her anger in response to the school district's attempt to hold me back in the first grade. Instead, she forced the teacher to assign me to the most advanced reading group, where I seemed to do just fine. That summer, she gifted the pencil box to me, and it, spells, and it still smells of pencil shavings and hard work. When you shake it, it helps if you say, chew, chew. <laughs> close our reading tonight, please welcome Thomas W. Case back to the podium as he shares a couple of his poems with us. Thank you. Dawn flies away like a mockingbird. I flirted with the sun as it blushed pink through the trees. Their naked branches spread wide 
wet with dew. Sticky sweet dawn winked with the promise of a new day. Swans mate for life and die in the spring, and she lied a little less than the moon and the fog and the wet cat drunk on feline dreams. Her eyes looked like they hated her face, like they wanted to leap out and roll down the street, find a mountain brook to wash off all they had seen. She saw too much, felt too much, as the fracture dawn laughed and flew away like a mockingbird. Thank you. This is artichokes, avocados, and Van Gogh. <laughs> I slept beneath a Mad Hatter moon and dreamed of a big blue tarantula swimming in a yellow moss-covered pond. A rat terrier passed me a note. Mercy and love are fleeting. They fade like the tangerine sun. They are lies like the dead bulls under a bloody red Spanish sky. I asked his name. Mendacity, he said, then turned into a pack of cigarettes. No matches, no lighter. I drank from the pond and became a sunflower. Vincent shot me with his lonely cornfield gun. He sat down and smoked his pipe as crows lied, lied, lied. He said with sad iris eyes, it's impossible to fuck a mermaid or eat a starry night. It's the impossibility of a thing that drives one mad. Like a Mustang caught for the circus, but always dreaming of escape to the thundering fields of its youth. I saw toothless orphans throw rocks at his soul as those beautiful eyes saw way too much. I want to pound it in, drive it dripping home through the core of a rose to the bottom of a tulip. I'll get drunk on nectar of the gods, then reject immortality. Who wants to live forever? There has been a drastic mistake. I see it at the zoo in the monkey's caged, glazed eyes. No wonder they throw shit at people. Such lies, he said, the artichoke, avocado, and algebra, the small of a woman's back, and the emerald head of a hummingbird. If artichokes and avocados are lies, I said, then truth is the tight, tasty, creamy green line that refuses to settle or waver, delirious, delicious. No, he said, as his hand stroked that lice-ridden crimson beard, it's conception and growth, then hewn down, cast out, bloody and naked, cut from the cord, and a lifetime spent trying to return to the womb, but only spilling and spreading the nightmare of being the fever of living to another sorry soul that didn't ask for it. I woke up, drained the elixir, and stared at Vinny's self-portrait, the one with bandaged ear, and I thought, yeah, God's into practical jokes. And thank all of you um, for making time in your evening to join us tonight and celebrate the work of the Community Stories writers. Their unique voices help us understand the ways in which the writing identity of Iowa City is relevant to everyone. Writing is a powerful way to acknowledge our stories, to see them in new contexts, and to make and remake the meanings of our lives. The five writers you've heard tonight make up only a small portion of the many, many writers who have taken part in the Community Stories Project. Their writing, and all of the writing that has been done in the workshop, illustrates very clearly what it is the Shelter House has done for those experiencing homelessness in our city. Namely, people experiencing barriers to stability are offered a safe place where they have access to support that they can use as a foundation in order to build towards self-sufficiency. Writing is a powerful way to make meaning of one's life 
But as all writers know, stability and security are required before any writer can be productive. The shelter house is a stable, secure place where such productivity is fostered. Thanks again to the UI Center for the Book and its generosity in providing the materials, time, and expertise to create the beautiful community stories portfolio. There's only one of them, but I would invite all of you to come up and have a look afterward. And thank you to Jan Weissmiller and Prairie Lights for hosting tonight's reading, and especially for donating 10% of the day's sales to the shelter house. Be sure to buy your summer reading tonight before you leave. <laughs> Finally, thank you again to our five authors. Thanks to Joel, to Kim, to Patty, to Anthony, and Thomas for writing diligently through the workshopping and editing process. Please join me in a final round of applause for our writers. And there are a few minutes left, so now the writers and, and we three facilitators will happily take your questions. I have a microphone. I can just come and if you'll raise your hand, I'll find you, and then I'll bring it back up here. Or if you'd like to maybe come toward the front, that would facilitate things if you're near an aisle and can do so. Anyone? I'm going to test this. Okay. Yeah, Peter. No, I, I just I just wanted to sort of get something started. I was, uh, was there you, you, the story? Yeah, um, you know when you read that story, I I I wondered. I found myself wondering, or it reminded me of that. I don't know if you've ever heard that Bill Cosby sketch about he's alone in the house and he listens to the story of the chicken heart. In anyway, it reminded me of that. It was just it was it was brilliant. So. Um, I don't really have, you know, I don't really have a question. I just sort of wanted to throw out a comment. Hopefully other people have more intelligent things to say. So. Some general appreciation. Yes. I would love it if each of you would talk to us about what you've learned about yourselves as writers in this process. Great question. Thank you very much. Who'd like to begin? I don't know. I started off writing poems, and by going into this course with the Writer's Workshop, they got me writing stories, and it helped me to open up more about myself. I believe through the process I've learned that I have to write, and if I don't write, I'll die or go crazy. Yeah, I uh, started out probably very uh, insecure in what my situation was. And um, through their sense of humor and hilarity, um, they were able to kind of break it down into, you know, uh, being a writer is just being a person. So um, talking about your, your difficulties and your mistakes are what make you uh, kind of attractive. Anthony, did you want to share anything? I guess. <laughs> For me, the writing thing was probably a uh, spur of the moment because I've never done it before. So for me to get the opportunity to do this and express whatever life thing through the days or the weeks or whenever I wrote was, was uh, how you say, probably a pretty good thing for me to kind of, you know, to share with with the writers group shop it's been a great time with them and i'm gonna have to push myself to do it some more so and like i was mentioned this thing with my daughter was the only thing i ever wrote in the past about me everything else was just like i said whatever happened the day before or the week before or whatever else so hopefully everybody enjoyed it and there's some more books over here that needs to get bought so. <laughs> I just want to say you guys were very awesome, and especially Patty, she's been helping me stay kind of sober. I've got 30 days in me um, next Tuesday, so um, you guys, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah.
and you guys are very good and this one just made me cry so uh it's very good thank you thanks still a few minutes left we can yes this is just a comment uh, the hamburger the cheeseburger thing brought back a memory for me uh, when I was younger, the pencil box thing brought back a memory for me. So all these things that you talked about brought back lots of memories for me, and I'm sure for other people in the audience. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. One more round of applause, and thank you all very much.